let's uh, talk about finding target superheat. Anybody know what target superheat is? Okay, where you want the superheat to be? But where you're supposed to, not where you want to. There you go, where you're supposed to have your superheat. Whenever we're taking our readings, if we've been doing this for a couple months or a couple of years, we have kind of a feel for what it should look like, right? You hook up, something's out of line, you're like, that doesn't look right. But Honestly, taking readings, you know, it, it doesn't really matter if you don't have an idea of what they should be. So just this general rule of thumb, like I don't think it's in the right area, I'm going to investigate more works and helps us not miss big problems. But um, we do actually have to know what it should be before we even hook up or else we're not really doing that important of a test. I'm just going to talk a little bit real quick about superheat, okay? Somebody, the first line there, what's the first line? If we we're going to flood our compressor. Okay, so target superheat helps us understand if we're going to flood our compressor. Very basic, uh, not target superheat, but superheat in general. And superheat lets us know that we're above liquid point. We've already finished our boiling. And the compressor doesn't like liquid at all, right? So we can measure superheat right at the air handler and it'll give us a clear indication of what just happened inside that evaporator coil. Often we're measuring superheat out at the compressor. We're hooking everything up out there. And out at the compressor, you have a clear indication of how that refrigerant is making it back to the system. On the note of flooding the compressor, what would be the opposite of flooding our compressor? Starving it, yeah. So it gets it's overheated because it's re refrigerant cooled. So if you have low pressure or really warm refrigerant, warm refrigerant wouldn't technically be starving, but it's just not cooling it. But low pressure is often the scenario where you are um, overheating your compressor. So it relies on the refrigerant to actually be cooled. So that's why you don't want a super high superheat, which typically means a warm suction line. Um, one, your system's not running efficiently, but you're also overheating your compressor. The evaporator, it tells us, superheat lets us know if the evaporator is being fed efficiently. Why is that? Liquid and gas. Liquid and gas, okay. If you have a really high superheat, you're boiling off the refrigerant way too quickly. You could be feeding more cold refrigerant into the system and running that evaporator more efficiently. When you switch, when you're boiling inside the system and you're in saturation, you are still absorbing heat. You have a cold saturation temperature, but it's not changing the temperature of a refrigerant, right? Because it's in saturation. So all of that heat being absorbed is going to change the state. It's working at trying to change the state, but it doesn't change the temperature until it becomes superheated. Once it becomes superheated, it immediately climbs in temperature while you add heat. So if you keep adding heat, it climbs in temperature. So if you have a high superheat right after your evaporator, that means a good ch chunk of your coil had high superheat or became superheated and then that coil got warm. It raised with the temperature. So you have a section of your coil that is warmer and you don't have as much heat transfer to it. So Superheat lets us know that we're, we're using our coil efficiently. If out of the coil we have eight degrees of superheat, it goes in the coil, let's say 40 degrees of saturation, comes out 48. That's a very efficient coil. And you've, you've only changed the temperature of the coil um, at the very end of that coil, did it boil off? And even that was only eight degrees of difference by the time it came out the, the end of that coil. So it's a very efficient coil. Let's us know if it's being fed efficiently. Uh, that would be considerations of it being underfed. What about uh, being overfed? Still liquid. Still liquid. So uh, it also lets us know the, um, on the bottom I put diagnosing TXV problems. So if you had like a wide open TXV, your superheat would be something that really helps you diagnose that. What would your superheat be if you had a wide open TXV? Zero to nothing. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, so, and then in that situation, you are still in saturation, so um, in one sense, you have a very efficient coil. But typically, uh, when you are, have a wide open TXV, it also raises the pressure, which means now we also have a warmer coil. So now our entire coil from start to finish is 52 degrees saturation instead of what it should be at 40 if it was metering properly. Um, sure, you add heat to it and it doesn't change from 50 degrees, it comes out as 50 degrees. Um, but the entire coil is now warmer than it, it could have been if we were actually properly metering. So it's less efficient. Typically a warm coil doesn't dehumidify well. What about if we have a really low um, superheat and we have a low suction pressure? What does that tell us about our load on the evaporator. We're going, we're moving to load on the evaporator now on the slide. Load is the term for what on our coil? Heat. That's right. It's our heat. So we are adding refrigerant, the amount of refrigerant that we are also adding heat. Or, or what I'm trying to say is that it's a balance game there. So I usually, for illustration sake, I'll say if you have a three ton compressor, then we're trying to get rid of three tons of heat. Um, and it's just, for the sake of illustration, makes it easy to think about. If your airflow is restricted and you're only moving two tons of heat, but your evaporator coil still has a lot more refrigerant than that moving through it, you're not gonna finish boiling it off. It's not gonna have nearly as much heat as it should, so the pressure's gonna start coming down. It'll get colder and colder. You have a low superheat, low um, suction pressure. Right? The opposite of being overfed, still we have a low superheat, but we have a high suction pressure. So when we are uh, trying to find our target superheat, we need a couple measurements. Outdoor, dry bulb temp, and return wet bulb temp. If you guys want to uh, open up measure quick, I have your probes all set up. So your outdoor uh, dry bulb temp is your sensible heat. It's the heat that you pick up with your senses most readily. It's the heat that we all talk about when we talk about temperature. So think of sensible heat as temperature heat, what you would read on a thermometer. That's dry bulb. Now uh, return wet bulb is exactly that. You can see in the picture illustration you have uh, one of the bulbs wet and air blowing on it so that will what will that do to the temperature? Increase it. Hmm? Increase it. Nope. Increase it. it increases the amount of heat in the area, but it doesn't, it decreases the temperature. It's just like splashing water on your arm, waving it around in the air. It gets colder. The evaporation effect. Wet bulb is basically um, a temperature related to how fast the evaporation process happens. How much moisture do we have in the air? How much heat do we have in the air? How fast will something evaporate? It? If you have 99% humidity, your air can't really hold that much more water. You bring in a wet bulb and you move it around in the air, it's going to evaporate really slow. There's not really a lot more room in the air to hold more water. So whereas if you have a drier space, you bring in that wet bulb, it'll evaporate really quick that you'll actually have a much lower wet bulb. So basically, wet bulb is taking into account uh, your latent heat in the space. Not just the sensible heat, but also the heat that's there related to moisture. So it's taking into account your moisture so that you can accurately uh, calculate your superheat, target superheat, how much heat is actually in the space. Because I'm not just changing the temperature, I'm also removing all this latent heat, the moisture in the air, right? So that's why you need your wet bulb. All right, tools are already turned on. The other things you would need to calculate your superheat would be a target superheat calculator. Does anybody know where to find that? Anywhere else you could find a target, your target superheat? Nope. Yep, Google the internet. What about? There's a slider, yep. Manual, manufacturer chart for that specific equipment. I have one up here. Apparently this is for R22, I don't think it really matters. 
the super heats are going to be very similar. But um, also, your measure quick. You guys are using measure quick every day. Mm. If you put in the tonnage of your system mm. and you change it from TXV to piston, and you have your probes, you have to have one actually connected to the outside air temperature, right? Then you're going to have your, uh, your target superheat. Measure quick will give it to you. Uh, did I mention that? Yeah, outdoor dry bulb temperature is very important. So your two measurement, outdoor dry bulb, not your indoor, and then your indoor wet bulb. All right, so the manufacturer chart, um, you have a outdoor, indoor wet bulb, outdoor dry bulb, and you just follow the lines and the intersect giving you your superheat. All right, so let's go ahead, let's figure it out. So the, we have your tools, you have what you need, find out what the target superheat should be on this system right here as if it was a piston system. HVAC school calculator or measure quick if you enter in all the information. Now, I have one in the return and one outside. What's the wet bulb? What's the return wet bulb? 59. Okay. Outdoor is what? 75? 73. 73 is what I have too, but... Outdoor wet bulb? No, dry, it's dry bulb. So outdoor dry bulb is what? Okay. I have my eyeballs yep. on. 1305. There you go. Yeah, it's really easy to, uh, on the calculator, to just put it in the wrong slot. Okay, so that's how you uh, actually are going to set your charge on a piston fixed metering device, right? So if you are below the superheat that you should be, and you're setting the charge, what do you need to do? Yeah, if you have a lower superheat, then what the target superheat is? Recover. Vent. Cover. Oh, sorry. Recover. You need to vent into a recovery machine. Yes. I've noticed when setting superheat on a system, it's actually a lot harder than on uh, a TXV because the TXV is automatically adjusting and setting that superheat so you have a little bit more play. But when setting on a piston, as soon as you get close, it's really easy to go over. You have to actually let it sit and the coil get down to temperature. When you've added charge, now the coil has to adjust in temperature and let it sit a little bit longer. And your adding process is a lot slower Manicure with the superheat. Okay, the big question of the day is why not 10 degrees of superheat every time? Why not just say, oh, we have a piston, because let's set variable. it for 10 degrees. It's it variable? It depends on temperature. What's, what's variable? The, the target. The target is variable, yeah, but why is it variable? Why, why not just always put it at 10? We don't have a constant temperature. Yeah. So things like outdoor temperature affect how much refrigerant, the, uh, how much pressure the refrigerant is moving at, right? So you can actually have 400 PSI on a 100 degree day that's a lot of liquid refrigerant pushing into your piston. Or you could have, you know, 280 on a cool day. And that's a huge difference in how much refrigerant is being pushed through the exact same little hole, little piston hole. So uh, if you look at this chart right here, let's say that um, you set it on an outdoor 65 degree day. Let's say you set it for 11 superheat, um, and your indoor was 70. You had a really warm, humid indoor. Indoor pool, basically. Notice what happens on our superheat when we go increase the temperature outside. You notice how on this chart the Numbers get lower and lower as the outdoor temperature goes up. So it's a little counterintuitive, you might think you're dealing with more heat. But it's because as the outdoor temperature goes up, it increases our liquid flow. So it's shoving a lot more into our coil. It will actually have lower. So if you were to set it for 10 superheat on a 65 degree day outside, and then the next time it was 100 degrees, you're probably going to be down three superheat to maybe zero superheat. And of course that's also related to the indoor heat. 10 superheat actually is a target for 65 on here as long as the indoor has an extremely low uh, wet bulb.
which is fine. That's why you actually have to know. So, make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, cool, that's it. Cool. Oh man, another round of applause, wow. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.